I'm Congressional Candidate Joe Kopsik. In my last video, I said sayonara to minority hire and former campaign committee treasurer Wookie John and introduced his replacement, interim committee treasurer Mr. Cuddlebear. However, Mr. Bear recently asked for a salary increase, and so he had to be scrapped. Literally. The firing of Mr. Bear and the subsequent elimination of the position of campaign committee treasurer reflect my new intention to run my campaign completely without either soliciting, accepting, or otherwise garnering any monetary contributions whatsoever. I believe that, in the process of attempting to secure the approximately 20,000 signatures required to put me on the ballot as an independent candidate for U.S. Representative from Wisconsin's 2nd Congressional District in November 2012, to use funds donated by citizens would be a waste of the people's hard-earned money, and it would undermine any grassroots credibility I hope to earn throughout the course of the campaign. Furthermore, now, in the aftermath of the Citizens United Campaign Finance Reform Supreme Court decision, at a time when the barriers to unlimited corporate and union finance of public elections have been broken down, and when successful presidential campaigns run costs approaching the billion dollar mark, to run a completely self-financed success successful campaign for public office on virtually no money at all would serve as a reminder to the American public that real democracy is not about money, it's about ideas. A major focus of my candidacy will be to encourage grassroots activity, direct action, volunteerism, and charity. President Obama has proposed limiting the federal income tax deduction on charitable donations by families making over a quarter million dollars per year to 28 percent. I believe this is part of a greater plan to turn government into an institution which could potentially wield something that approaches a monopoly in the appropriation of charitable contributions, as well as a monopoly in deciding what constitutes worthwhile charity itself. We cannot trust government to aid foreign countries because it often gives taxpayer money to those countries' dictators. Neither can we trust our, elect our elected officials to determine on our behalf what constitutes a legitimate char charitable deed any more than can we, we can determine what constitutes the public good simply by putting it to a vote. Congressman Ron Paul believes that when the government pledges to donate monetary aid to relief efforts such as the recent effort to provide relief following the earthquake in Haiti, it reduces both the incentive for and the ability of individual citizens to make private donations, and it becomes more likely that taxpayer money will get lost in the bureaucracies of the governments and relief organizations involved. Adam Smith wrote that an individual, in exercising his freedom to voluntarily participate in marketplace activities, generally, quote, neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it, end quote. But if willing participants in democracy only vote in accordance with their own selfish individual desires, how can we trust the outcome of that vote will appropriate money to the right causes? How can we determine what is in the interest of the public if we cannot trust democratic institutions or our elected or appointed officials to do the same? Ludwig von Mies and Friedrich Hayek used the term catalaxy to describe the order brought about by the mutual adjustment of many individual economies and of voluntarily cooperating actors in the market. Catalaxy is the so-called spontaneous order, which Adam Smith articulated as the invisible hand of the market. Catalaxy can only exist in a totally voluntary society in which there is no fraud, deception, abuse, violence, force, or coercion. Therefore, true free market capitalism is not tyrannical, nor is it an order which can be imposed either upon or by state apparatus. In a catalytic, catalactic system, the only order and rules that exist are not legalistic or de jure, but the de facto status quo set of practices which are brought about through the cooperation of parties to mutually voluntary agreements. When such mutually voluntary agreements are made, they can be formally upheld and enforced through contracts. If any party is found by mutually agreed upon arbitrator to be in violation of the contract, that party is held accountable in the way that the contract dictates. These arbitrating entities are otherwise known as Dispute Resolution Organizations, or DROs. Examples of DROs include judges and agencies that enforce the terms of insurance contracts. The Constitution of the United States is an example of such mutually voluntary agreements. The states willingly gave up some of their powers to the federal government, and the Constitution provides mechanisms whereby states and the federal government may negotiate the terms of their continued cooperation. The American governments, free market capitalism, and catalaxy are systems which are built on voluntarism and consent. A citizen authorizes his government to rule over him 
as a condition of government author authorization of citizen participation in changing the way the government is run. This means that consent and authority are similar. A truly authoritarian government is one which is based on the authority of the people and not on power, and not on power wielded by the so-called authoritarian dictators claiming to represent them. So how may we reclaim our government from the despotic control of this overly centralized representative democratic republic called the United States of America, while at the same time addressing the problem of creating a libertarian system in which individuals are free to act, though often in ignorance of what is in the interest of the public? I suggest that the answers are education, the dissemination of information, and the creation of what I would term an enlightened catalexy. It helps to first conceive of the state as a corporation which allows citizens to publicly invest in an enterprise which aims to create a net profit in the amount of freedom afforded to its investors. To, to paraphrase what free market anarchist Gustave de Molinari wrote in The Production of Security, the purpose of the state is to, to provide security, defense, representation, liberty, and justice, which are to be thought of as commodities just like any other physical product. The fundamental impediment to the creation of an enlightened catalaxy is that people do not know enough about the products they are buying or the candidates for which they are voting. The people do not know how to successfully affect the outcome which they hope to achieve by purchasing or voting the way they do because they cannot trust the products they purchase and consume to function safely and reliably any more than they can trust politicians to tell the truth about how they plan to legislate. Our generation needs to bring about a dramatic resurgence in the voluntary direct action provision of charity. This is the only way we can address the most urgent problems at hand in our society without necessitating intrusion by wasteful government bureaucracies and or a system of violent involuntary taxation whereby individuals have portions of their earnings forcibly collected from them under penalty of imprisonment and supervision by gun-wielding officers of the law. One of Congressman Ron Paul's long-term goals is to transition to, into a system in which there will be little or no compulsory taxation, and most or all government services will be funded entirely by voluntary contributions. I suggest that, as a way to complement this system, some government services be provided through direct action public service efforts by citizen volunteers. The most important types of efforts that would, be, that would be influenced by these changes would be the discovery, disclosure, and dissemination of information regarding consumer protection and safety, and regarding the proceedings of government and the positions of candidates for public office. In essence, this would amount to a mostly volunteer citizen consumer advocacy program. Such a program would provide for a more effective and efficient education of consumers and voters so that a person participating in the marketplace or in the democratic process would have greater access to resources when it comes to making decisions about how they would like to utilize the market and government to affect the change they want to see in the world. Consumers and citizens would tend to be better informed and more conscious about the causality of the outcomes that the actions in which they participate have upon the remainder of the public, and they would have more information on which to draw when they are just trying to determine which types of actions are morally acceptable to them, as well as consistent with any intentions they might have in making such decisions. This system would allow people to act freely in accordance with their morality, and consumers and citizens would be free to exercise their will either to refuse or agree to compromise with people who they believe act in ways that are contrary to their own morality. It is a system which acknowledges that individual human beings, and not groups, organizations, or government apparatus, are and should be the only entities which can act on principled voluntary decisions and opinions. It would be a system in balance if only people could prove themselves truly ready to commit to and accept the axiomatic utopian solution which has been recommended by so many critically thinking minds throughout history, which is that some of us must, at least occasionally, be prepared to volunteer to perform labors whose rewards are evident in their own results that sometimes some people must recognize that work can be its own reward and that we should at times help others without guarantee that we will be helped to a degree of equal value by our own subjective standards. This is the essence of my dispute with socialism, particularly the works of Marx and Proudhon. To suggest that a laborer should demand the exact value of the product of his labor and his wages is to suggest that there should be no production of wealth at all and to downplay the importance of hard work, which is, in a free society, voluntarily performed by the laborer. If you live in a system in which you're allowed to quit your job, negotiate the terms of your hiring, 
ask for a raise or promotion, join, leave, and pay wages to unions freely, and associate with fellow workers in order to try to obtain better treatment, pay, or benefits. You have no reason to call wage labor coercive, hierarchical, exploitative, or equate wage labor with slavery. You're only enslaved and exploited if you hate what you do and curse your employer for how little he gives you. Nothing would ever get done in, the, in this world if no person were willing to give up something of himself without first being promised something of equal or greater value in return. I believe that a society operating in a state of enlightened catalaxy would embrace, embody, and enshrine the ethic of reciprocal altruism, and that if, when, and to what extent it would prove ex itself successful, it would prove the intrinsic worth of the human spirit, being that it would reject the notion that people are inherently amoral or immoral, or that people only act charitably when they are compelled to do so by government or by religious institutions. Take a lesson from the book of Job. Be grateful for what you have. Rejoice in the opportunity to serve, whether you're serving your boss or your deity. Mother Teresa once said, work without love is slavery. It's called charity. I'm Joe Kopsik, and I approve this message.